today, I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Hank Brown. Throughout his 40-year career, Mr. Brown has held several positions in public service. Most recently, Mr. Brown served as the 21st president of the University of Colorado. Prior to his time at CU, Mr. Brown was president and CEO of the Daniels Fund. Also, from 1998 to 2002, Mr. Brown served as the 11th president of our own, very own University of Northern Colorado. Mr. Brown has also spent six years serving Colorado in the U.S. Senate, which was preceded by five consecutive terms in the U.S. House representing Colorado's 4th con Congressional District. Today, Mr. Brown is a senior counsel in Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek's Denver office, and also he served 11 years as vice president under Mr. Mockler. So please help me in welcoming Mr. Hank Brown. Can you hear me okay? Do I want to use that one? The back, I hesitate to ask that because the last group I spoke to, uh, there was a whole group in the, in the, the back that, that raised their hands and they couldn't hear. And uh, the whole front row walked and changed places with them. <laughs> Let's go ahead with it. Well, what's this stuff about ethics? All of the rules, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Class simple. Why are you spending a half a day on this? It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Simple. You know, some of you uh, have the bad uh, judgment to be accounting majors, and the rest of you are like, uh, finance majors, and perhaps even all of you have spent a little time worrying about what's on that balance sheet as you look through it. And we as a society spend a lot of time trying to figure out just an exact way to report what the assets and liabilities are of companies. Will Daniels used to say that the greatest asset he had was his reputation for integrity. It never showed up in the balance sheet. It never was reported on the, uh, an asset to borrow against. But to him, it was the single most important asset that he had. And the greatest key he had towards making money. He didn't do badly. When he passed away, he uh, had a billion dollars that he gave to his foundation. Uh, some of you may even be Daniel Scholars. Uh, about a third of his money goes to his scholarships. For students, about two thirds to help people who are a little less fortunate. But his biggest asset in his mind was his reputation for integrity. So, is it something that's easy? Well, I don't know. Some of you may have uh, talked to philosophy majors, but one of the many schools in the country now uh, teach ethics and philosophy, and their ethics is pretty uh, basic. It's, uh, I think they would use a term rational. That is, Ethics is rationality. You should think through your actions, you should think through what you do, and you ought to make sure what you do is advantageous. So, is it advantageous to cheat on an exam? On the one hand, you might get better grades. Some people I know have cheated gotten worse grades. On the other hand, you might get caught and suffer terrible consequences. And so, on a rational basis, you end up being honest. Not because it's some fundamental rule, but because it's to your advantage. And that's pretty much the way many people teach uh, ethics in the world. That's not the way Bill Daniels saw it. It's not the way Kenny Mumford saw it. Some of you may be saying, well, wait a minute. You mean that ethics ought to control my activities even when it's not to my advantage? And that answer is a few. But yes, I think they would say very much so. I remember one time uh, in the floods, and you probably are thinking of the floods in the, uh, in the canyon that was taking place this last year. This was in, uh, in the 70s. There were over 100 lives lost. And uh, at that time, uh, my division, it was a meat company. Uh, we retailed meat, uh, tried to go to a uh, customer package, so we were very conscious of trying to build a brand name. And uh, during the flood, uh, there were over 100 people lost. And uh, they literally had no place for the remains, the bodies. And uh, I got a call one afternoon. And uh, they were asking if they could use one of our refrigerated trucks uh, to store the bodies in. Well, keep in mind, we're in the meat business. 
you have a wholesome product, you want people to desire it. Somehow having corpses stored in a Montford truck with the letters this big that say Montford on it doesn't sound very rational, does it? I'm not sure how many of you marketing agents would say that's a good way <clears throat> to promote your meat sales. <laughs> Unless it's to a very small group of people that like to have unusual taste. <laughs> Kenny didn't hesitate. It wasn't a rational decision to think about. There was a huge risk to it. As a member of the community, it was the right thing to do provide a way to refrigerate the bodies for the claim process. Uh, obviously, he hoped that no one would take a picture, and indeed, no one did. Uh, to the credit of the media, that they were What I want to suggest to you is that that rationality mentality, the rationality motive for ethics, is indeed widely held, viewed, but it's not the kind of ethics that I was familiar with with Ken Montford or with Bill Daniels. As some, I think, are you are very familiar with the Daniels story. Uh, Bill was in the business of helping people get into the cable television business. He sought uh, uh, licenses uh, to provide cable services in cities. He would then sell those, uh, uh, those cable services uh, as a nationwide program. And because of his contacts, his reputation was everywhere. And, uh, he also loved sports. He was a sports fanatic. He was a Golden Gloves, Golden Gloves boxing champion. He was a star athlete in high school. But, uh, he never went on to college. Uh, the war came along and he never had time to, to go back to school, so he didn't have, I think, the advantage of, that you all are getting. But as his career went well, he invested in uh, the Utah Jazz basketball team in Salt Lake. He loved it. He loved all competitive sports. He plowed all the money that the basketball team generated back into the team, and they had a big championship in that new league. But uh, unfortunately, the league simply wasn't strong enough to end up uh, having the full league. Bill Daniels had to do their bankers. Not personal bankers. He wasn't personally responsible for any of the debts of the team. But the corporation that owned the team was bankrupt. He did everything he could to keep it alive. He put whatever money he had into it to keep it going. But the reality was that the revenue simply wasn't there. You know, much of the revenue now was pieces of television. And in those days, there wasn't a lot of it, at least to, uh, the box office was a key thing. So his team goes bankrupt. There are a lot of people shorted. The players didn't get their full year salary, their contract salary. The manager didn't get their full year salary. The fans who paid for season long tickets uh, didn't get to see the full season as the whole. It broke Bill's heart. Absolutely bothered him beyond the world to have, in effect, cheated out of what he thought was their duty, what they contracted. And then after a year or two went by and his business as a broker did well, Bill went back to all those people that had been shortchanged in the key went bankrupt. And he paid them everything he owed them plus interest. He went to the guys who were sold sodas in the arena, the ticket holders, the managers, to the, uh, the ball players. Was he required to do so? No. He was legally discharged from any of those uh, any of those debts. Their debt, the debt that was involved, was the debt of the team that had gone bankrupt, not Bill Daniels. But for Bill Daniels, that was the right thing to do. Was it a rational decision? I don't know. You make up your own mind. Maybe part of his success is that people heard about it and knew that this was somebody they wanted to deal with. This was somebody they could trust. Was it rational? I'm not so sure. We had in the 70s uh, uh, price freeze in Montford. Uh, 
For those of you who are history buffs will know the Roman Empire played with price pieces uh, uh, now and then. And they were absolutely dismal failures, uh, as was the Nixon price figures. But during the 70s, uh, inflation got out of hand, both with the big expenditures, big deficit spending on, uh, on the Vietnam War, along with big deficit spending that the Congress put forward. Nixon tried to deal with it initially by refusing to spend money that Congress had pro appropriated if he thought you could do things a little bit more cheaply, a little more economically than what Congress had done. So in a broad range of areas, he simply refused to spend all the money that Congress had appropriated. Well, Congress brought legal action. Eventually, they uh, passed a statute that required him to spend the money, which is, for some people, sounded a little unusual when you're running massive deficits. Uh, but in that atmosphere, you had horrendous inflation. Uh, it obviously got worse when President Carter came into office uh, and the deficit went even further. And, but uh, at that point, inflation ended up being the number one issue, political issue, in the country. And so Nixon came up with an idea. He would freeze prices. And he set about uh, massive guidelines. Congress uh, had given him the power to do so. He said about massive guidelines is what price you could sell things for. In the meat business, remember Montford was the world's biggest cattle feeder at the time, as well as a packer, that is they processed the animals, as well as a portion cutter. So they would cut the, the, the meat into individual portions, like you might buy in the grocery store, or uh, it could be sold to the hotels and restaurants. The price freeze number that the administration came up with was they realized how difficult it would be to put a, a limit on the price of livestock. Because the price of livestock depends on a lot of things, not just the weight, but the quality of the animal, the yield of the animal, uh, the quality of the meat, and so on. So what they did is they put uh, an upper limit on on the price uh, that uh, you could sell the meat for, the various kinds of cuts. They didn't put a limit on the price of cattle. They put a limit on the meat after it's processed, after the animals were killed. Well, the first week, nothing much happened. <coughs> uh, prices stayed pretty stable. Uh, they had been going up dramatically, and they stayed level. And then the next week, they inched up above the yellow sheet, that price limit. And how did they do it? Well, somebody figured out a rinky day. It was Kenny's firm. Uh, it was a, a way around the law. And the rinky day was this. You want uh, your A&P. You want to buy meat from me. I can't sell you at the limited price uh, because it's unprofitable for them. In other words, I can't buy the live animal because that price isn't controlled, and come up with red meat that fits the price guide. So what do I do? I go to A and B and I say, look, you buy the cattle. I'll process them for a fee on the money, and you get me. It was a total way around uh, the price for it. And slowly, every packer in the United States Every meat packer in the United States went to that. Uh, the Nixon administration did not follow up on it, did not nail people for violating the price rules. But every packer went to it except one, and that was uh, At first, it was costing $500 for every one of the trucks that people packed into it. And then it was $1,000. And then it was $2,000. And then it was $5,000. By the end, prices had moved to the point where it was costing him over $10,000 for every truck that leaves the packing plant. You look at that packing plant north, it's the same size, but it's actually a little bigger packing plant. But you'll notice there's hundreds of trucks, hundreds of trailers there. Literally, it was costing him tens of millions of dollars to honor the price for this. But with Kenny, there was no question 
about whether you would violate the law or circumvent the price freeze. Initially, the price freeze went away. It was obviously a disaster, uh, not just for honest people, but for everyone in the world. Obviously, that was a price freeze was not the way to combat inflation. How many of you would have made the same decision that Kenny made? Would you? No? Why? Say again. More efficient. More efficient. Anybody else? Would you have made the same decision, Kenny May? Anybody? Yeah. You have to face yourself in the mirror every morning. Ah, did you all hear that? You have to face yourself in the mirror every morning. Well, let me give you a different viewpoint. You have shoppers and shareholders. Shareholders expect you to uh, maximize their profits, to return to them interest on the investment. It wasn't just Kenny's company, uh, he was a major shareholder. Uh, would that persuade you? Who in the back? What do you think? Would you have made the same decision? Probably. <clears throat> what I want to suggest to you is that ethics is different than the simple subject you may have thought of. Ethics is not simply a matter of you're going to be uh, fair and honest with people. Uh, and if you do that, the decisions will pretty well make themselves. Ethics is tough. One day, uh, Kenny had run for, uh, for governor in Colorado. And, uh, excuse me, run for Senate in Colorado. And many of uh, the people in the Democratic Party, who's a Democrat, uh, thought he would run for governor the next time out. When we built a new feedlot at the Pilgrims, uh, the trade unions came in and uh, sat down with Kenny and they said, look, we want you to use all union contractors to build the Pilgrims feedlot. If you use all union contractors, they didn't say this, but probably the case it would maybe cost you five ten percent a few hundred thousand dollars more maybe more than, uh, to build both the union contractors versus non-union contractors uh, kenny had met with them and they said oh by the way uh, you want to be governor if you'll use union contractors we'll guarantee you the support of the afl cio in the election which will guarantee your nomination for the Democratic Party. How would you have decided? What would you have done? What would you have done? I can't hear you. It's a tough decision, isn't it? <coughs> what are the factors? Anybody? What, what would be going through your mind? How much more it's going to cost? What else? Anything else? Come on. You're not doing very well with thinking this. Maybe the greater good accomplishes government. Greater good accomplishes government. Quality of the work. Quality of the work. Which way would that go? Ah, okay. So, which contractor would be the best job? And obviously, there would be a debate on that. The union folks would think they would be better. I mean, you would have a different view Yes. Pay to play. Once you pay to play, then if he's the governor or whatever, everyone else will be looking for him to pay to play down the line. Oh, very good. This is a slippery slope, isn't it? Once you let people know that you can be bought. You're the one they're going to come to with more deals like this. I always thought it would be, as a legislator, once you let people know that you responded to pressure rather than logic, every time there was a tough vote, you'd get 10 times the pressure other people would. Because you were a right target. Well, what Kenny did was listen to them, was polite to them, thanked them, and then went out and took the lowest uh, lowest bids from quality contractors. 
a few of them ended up being uh, uh, union contracts. Uh, most of them ended up being non union But Kenny had an obligation that was more important than just the people of Colorado. Who did he have an obligation to? Shareholders. Shareholders, sure. Once you're in a public company, you have an obligation to those shareholders. It's a trust that you hold. And you have an obligation to do the best you can for them. Now, could you rationalize it and say, look, this will prevent work stoppages and so on? Sure. You can do that. But none of these issues are going to be very easy. They're going to be tough. And they're not going to be straightforward. They're not going to be simply ones that you can rationally sit down and say, this is to my advantage, and that's not. Guess what I'm trying to suggest to you is that ethics is a far more difficult process. It'll be up to you to figure out what kind of <coughs> ethics you believe in and how you want to run it. But I think you said it best, you have to look at the mirror. <coughs> ethics for each one of you ultimately will depend on you satisfy, satisfying yourself. It will have to come down to what you're comfortable with, what you can do, and what you think is worthwhile, and not worthwhile. You know, the, the question of whether I cheat on this exam is pretty silly. It's pretty easy. Because if you get caught, the consequences are so much more uh, devastating than the rewards you get out of cheating on the exam. Pretty well, it's not to cheat on the exam. But the challenges you face in business are much tougher. Well, my heart is we've seen some things up. Now it's your turn. What questions do you have? Anybody want to bring anything up? Yes. Have you personally faced any ethical decisions that have kind of changed, changed the course of your career? Um, have I faced any ethical decisions that have changed the course of my career? I think so. But uh, you know, we all tend to be self-serving, at least I suspect I am. Uh, with it. In, in politics, it was pretty easy to slip into a mode where you make decisions that are good for your career rather than what you believe in. Uh, and uh, let me give you an example. We have in the United States a, uh, a series of, of legislations, bills, uh, that are, are really pretty special interest ones. Uh, the, the most glaring example probably is the tobacco bill. We have a tobacco bill that relate, regulates the price of tobacco in effect by giving the tobacco growers more than what the world market is. It's not unusual to do the same thing uh, in sugar, peanuts, and a variety of other commodities. Um, dairy milk. Everybody in that business, or most everybody in that business, likes you if you vote for them. It goes without saying. At the same time, we have legislation that urges people not to use the tobacco that we've subsidized. The producers would say, wait a minute, it's not a subsidy, it's a price subsidy. So that, that's a different discussion. They can use something. But if you think about it, that's pretty schizophrenic. You're subsidizing the product, you end up urging people not to use. If you just make up your mind, you save millions of dollars as you go through the thing. When people go to Congress, usually nobody votes for the tobacco bill. Well, it's pretty silly. Maybe if you're from North Carolina, you would vote for the tobacco bill. But beyond that, it'd be pretty tough to vote for. After you've been there 10 years, 99% of the people vote for Now why? Well, what happens is they come to you and say, hey, uh, you've got a lot of sugar beet growers in your industry, at least we did then. We're just not sure we can support the sugar program if we don't have your vote for the tobacco program. Actually, I a lot of amendments to do with the tobacco programs. 
at a point that you get into that, in my view, you violated your own standards. Uh, did I do that? I don't think so. But the danger of it, both in Congress and my guess is in business, is that after a while, you may not know the are doing. After a while, you may get so used to trading one for another that you don't realize you've lost the reason that you came here. You've lost the reason that you're in business or you've abandoned your integrity. Now, should all of you be 100% purists? Well, that'd be nice. It might be nice. Uh, my guess is that not many of you would live your life that way. Uh, and life is about making mistakes and learning from them and going on and doing better. But I, I think that there have been lots of times when it would have been tempting to do one thing uh, that you really didn't believe in. Now, there are folks who go back to Washington and are much more flexible than their people. Uh, there are districts in this country that elect people to go get pork. That's their job. And their job is to go back and trade votes to bring as much money as they can back home. And uh, obviously, we have a majority in Congress that feel that, or else we wouldn't be where we're at. Uh, so it's not an unheard of uh, kind of way of looking at them. At the same time, I think each of us know that we destroy the system. My guess is you face the same thing in business. Where going along will seem the right way to get along. It's in really, that wasn't my experience in business. But, but you, may, you may end up feeling different. Others. Surely there's been something you're concerned about that you listen to these ships. Um, he did worry about uh, uh, going under. Obviously, there were some times, particularly there was a, a strike in, uh, let's see, 1979, 1980, uh, where the company had just uh, was in the process of opening the plant in Grand Island so that the finances were stretched. The cattle market was bad, and so we were losing a lot of money with the cattle. And, uh, the meat package union went out on strike at the greeting plant. And uh, it was a bit of shock to Kenny, I think, because he always prided himself on working with the union. Um, at that point, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the meat industry, what happened is all the old packers went out of business. Swift, Armour, Cuddy, Wilson had killed ones, and they were paying uh, very high wages. And along came in the new packers, Iowa beef, Missouri beef, and everything. And they were signing contracts for five dollars an hour with very low fringe benefits. Uh, Kenny was with at the old packers level, which was like thirteen seventy an hour. So he was more than two and a half times higher on hourly basis than what the new packers were paying. And the other packers that had been at his level had gone out of business. The union wanted to raise, even though they just signed contracts with, uh, with other companies at much lower levels. Kenny didn't feel like to do that. So he had a strike with really some of the company. Uh, so yeah, he, he had a number of times. And then obviously any of you who are familiar with the business, you know, um, it, it, uh, it's an enormously volatile business. Uh, the price can go up or down dramatically and you may lose a couple hundred dollars a head or you may gain a couple hundred dollars a head depending on what the market goes. So it's, uh, there's reason to be nervous. Oh, yes. yes. I was just curious, was that before or after the Gilchrist line? Uh, the, before or after the Gilchrist line? Oh, the Gilchrist. The Gilchrist, let's see, we went public in 69, January of 70. And the Kilgrass feedlot was under construction in 70, 71, 72. 
the strike was uh, uh, yeah, about eight or nine years ago. So it, those two were. two to agree, and it takes two to disagree. Uh, so the press obviously made a decision of who they wanted to blame for the show. And indeed sold that to the nation. Uh, but you had, uh, both sides felt strongly about what they believed in, and I, I take that as an act of integrity. Uh, and felt strongly about it. Uh, you can make your decision as to whether that was a valid point or not. Um, the debate is somewhat bizarre because they combined with it the extinction of the debt ceiling. And that was described as a default. And that is, uh, regardless of your belief, that is an absolutely false, inaccurate, totally inaccurate description of what it is. The failure to increase the debt limit is uh, simply an automatic balance budget. It limits your expenditures to what you have coming in. Doesn't mean you're going to default at all. I can't imagine anybody who would pay their debts first. Uh, and the reason you would is because if you don't, you face terrible consequences. So that default nonsense is a good point already. I've seen the pressure on people, but it's totally inaccurate. Uh, in terms of, of uh, the extension, uh, Years ago, when Nixon had his dust up with Congress, and they passed a law that required him to spend money, uh, the quid pro quo on that was Congress's agreement to put a budget process in, in place. And the budget process is basic, pretty simple. The House passes a budget, the Senate passes a budget, and the budget says how much they're going to spend in each of the 13 areas of the federal budget. The 13 categories we spend on it. And it lays how much your limit is on each one of them. The two houses get together and work out their differences. Uh, and that ends up in a budget resolution. That's not a law. It doesn't go to the president for signature. It's totally Congress. The significance of that is that that's a limit on what you can spend in each category. It's a plan for spending and it's a limit. So if a bill comes out that spends more than what's in the budget, someone can make a point of order that it exceeds the budget and the bill's dead. And what they do to get around that is they waive the budget. Well, the last four years, um, the budgets have been embarrassing, to put it mildly. Um, and they're embarrassing um, because the deficit is so huge. The Senate has used to pass a budget. I think they passed it one year and then we need to reconcile it. Uh, well, what happens if you don't pass a budget? Then you have no limit on appropriations. Um, so the shutdown came partly because the Senate had refused to go along with the budgeting process and didn't process the bill since they came along. What you're supposed to do is pass an appropriation bill in each one of the 13 areas. The House and the Senate may disagree and they reconcile in the, in the conference committee. What the Senate had done is refuse to take up the bills and refuse to ask for a conference committee when they had a disagreement. So I didn't see it as a moral issue, I saw it as a tactical issue. Um, the incumbents, incidentally, in both parties, the senior members in both parties kind of like not having the regular order done appropriation as well. Because if you pass an appropriation bill that comes to the floor, and <coughs> people can offer amendments, the, the 
eliminate some of the nonsense or add some nonsense. If you do a continuing resolution, the insiders, the committee chairman, get to write up a continuing resolution and have enormous control. Uh, so usually your senior leadership in both parties kind of like secretly like a continuing resolution. Which I always thought was something of a corrupt way of doing things, but uh, that's what we've ended up with in these last few years. With the field of yeah. Do you think that um, Congress and government has an inherent an ethical? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you very well. Do you well. think that the government or being in the government or being in Congress has a I'm, I'm going to come up a little bit, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Do you, you think that having been in Congress, that it has been an ethical component to do that job more so than any other kind of business, or do you see that? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, I don't know. Can uh, you repeat the question, the, the question was, being in government, how does it affect my outlook on business, or my ability to do business? Oh, 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 that's an easy question. <laughs> Business, you will find, is far more ethical than any other form of activity in society. I've headed a nonprofit foundation with the government. There is no question that business is far more ethical. Now, why? Some of you are saying, gee, that's not what the press tells me. They tell me those, those business people are, are out for the profit which incidentally makes us more productive. But the reason there are more ethical, by far, than either government or, or nonprofits, is because there is an automatic penalty if you're unethical. If you're unethical in business, and you're caught it, people simply don't do business with you. In the meatpacking business, we sold millions of dollars of product over the phone. And we reached an agreement over the phone. You do a follow-up confirmation. <coughs> but people honored their word. Now, they honored their word why? Because they were honest? Well, many of them were honest. But they also honored their word because it was a huge penalty. But if they didn't honor it, you simply wouldn't do business with them. If you're buying cattle and uh, somebody cheats you on the deal, you simply don't deal with them. Uh, in government, there's not that same discipline. It's very rare that you have people disciplined or the dishonesty. And my guess is all of you, uh, in both parties have identified people uh, in the last week who said things that are absolutely dishonest and no dishonest. And there's no penalty for it. Uh, in the nonprofit world, the charity, it's a similar kind of thing. You'll find business is much more ethical. Because you have that automatic enforcement. Um, since we're talking about business and politics side by side, usually the, the intermediary, the liaisons, are lobbyists. So I'd like you to address the ethical nature of lobbying between these two groups when you say that the business world is more ethical than the government world, not the percent of water. How do the lobbyists fit in the middle here when the lobbyists are clearly being paid by a nonprofit or a nonprofit to influence the government? Uh, well, think for a moment about the role of a lobbyist. Uh, we have images that we get from the, from the media about uh, what a pernicious influence they are. Lobbyists are a hired gun. They end up lobbying for uh, whoever pays them. Um, the major thing you hope for if you're hiring a lobbyist is someone who has contacts. I always got a kick out of the cable industry um, who were really quite very conservative business leaders. Maybe there were some exceptions, but not many. They were very conservative. Their lobbyists were all liberal Democrats. Why? Because the Liberal Democrats controlled Congress. 
they hired somebody who could communicate with the people they needed to influence. Um, the value of a lobbyist, you need someone who knows how Washington works, the state legislature works, who knows the people there, um, to get your message across. Um, now, having said that, that was never the way I preferred people to operate. Um, most people you'll find are open to their constituents coming back. But the reality is, if you earn your living in Colorado, it's difficult to go back to Washington. Uh, it's difficult to take the time out to do it. It's difficult to make the contacts. It's very helpful to have somebody who has a relationship. Um, I suppose if I were going to reform the system, it would be to eliminate political action for um, And the reason I say that is because political action committees take money from workers in a plan or in a business, and they donate that as part of the lobbying efforts. Now, do some people who have PACs donate it for the good of society? Yes. I'm sure there are some people who do that. Not many. Most political action committees are part and parcel of your effort to lobby Congress. People who lobby Congress don't lobby for the ideals you may have about government. They lobby and give money to people who are going to help them. And I think it's a perversion because it is a way to take money for someone who might normally donate to a Democrat and give it to a Republican. You take it from someone who might donate it to a Republican and give it to a Democrat. It doesn't reflect what you'd like in government. It reflects an effort to buy influence. Uh, at least my own sense is that the political action committee should be done with. Should you be able to donate? Sure. The Supreme Court's uh, said that's part of your free speech. But uh, putting that barrier up between a person and their money, I think distorts the system and corrupts the system. Um, I was just wondering, being involved in politics, do you think it's time to host um, an ethics ethics league at Congress and like require them to go? <laughs> you know, you you know you want you want you know college students to be a part of ethics, like and so that we grow up and, and be ethical. But do you think it's time for ethical reform? Um, that's that's a fun question. I served on the House Ethics Committee, we call it the House Committee on Official Standards, for eight years. Uh, actually, six years, and I got called back on when Jim Wright uh, was uh, a the speaker of the House was disciplined. Uh, Congress has an ethics standard. Uh, they have a large staff of lawyers that help you interpret it. And one of the things that's helpful uh, if you're trying to follow it is uh, I always had our, our folks check with the ethics committee to make sure what we were doing followed the rules that they laid out. Um, having said that, the major ethical problem Congress has is the training of folks. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. And as long as people cast their votes that way, you destroy the country. I don't know how many of you have read um, the Federalist Papers. My guess is all of them, right? Come on. Really? <coughs> How is that possible if you get through college and not read the Federalist Papers? Well, your, your education is deficient. Go read In the Federalist Papers, they ask this question. What's going to happen when the special interests get involved? They didn't ask it quite those terms. Uh, and the answer, I think it's uh, Madison who wrote this one, talks about it, is that the special interests will offset each other. The fact that I want this and someone else wants this means that we'll have to fight each other together. Let me describe what happened the first vote I was on the floor of the house. We had a, an egg bill come out. The, the limit for the egg bill that year was like 12 billion. The house version of the egg bill cost 14 billion. So it was 2 billion over, and they waived the budget. 
is that they do all the time. The Senate passed an ag bill that cost 16 million, more than the House. They went to conference to sort out the differences, and they came up with an ag bill that cost 18 million. How did they do that? You get what you want, you get what you want, conference closed. How do you think we got a $17 trillion deficit? They traded votes, so everybody got paid off. My turn, inflammatory. But that, I think, is the ethics problem with Congress. It's not dealt with. Now, theoretically, it's against the rules to trade votes. Practically, it is the heart and soul of what happens back there. And until we have some sort of limit on spending, like a constitutional limit, you're not going to address the problem. But I think you desperately need to change that point because as long as it's set that way, I wish I could describe to you the way we waste money. Some of you are thinking, gee, these government programs are meant to help the poor. And indeed, some of them are and are worthwhile. But a lot of the programs have nothing to do with the poor. Raising the price of milk so little kids have to pay a higher price for it, what does that have to do with the poor? There's a honey program based on the thesis that, that bees will lose interest in flowers if you don't have a subsidy. <laughs> There's hundreds of programs. So, yes, Congress has a huge ethics problem, but it comes down to that trading votes, in my view. In terms of the other things they do, you have a very efficient system with the staff lawyers that help you stay within the rules. And if somebody violates those, it means that they just didn't have six enough to check them. We probably have time for one more question. Thank you. Up here. No? Who's our last question? Yes. Do you find it unethical for Congress to accept their paychecks when they're in the lockdown and uh, other government employees want to be Do I find it unethical for Congress to accept their paychecks uh, when other people are locked out? Actually, as you notice, they they passed a bill that paid everybody even when they hadn't worked. Right. Uh, so, which, which I found unusual. But, uh, but to your question, no, I don't think they should. Now, the Constitution prohibits you from reducing their pay uh, during terms of service, or changing their pay in terms of service, up or down, in terms of this, uh, the, uh, the term they're on. So, from a constitutional point of view, you probably couldn't avoid it. But from an ethical point of view, you could, and a few people did, uh, turn the, the payback in or donate to the charity, which I think they should. Hey, thank you for having me. Lots of fun.